Grace and peace to you all. I am Camille LeBron Powell, the pastor of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Tucker, Georgia. We are a congregation that seeks to welcome all and serve the community for the glory of God. We're glad that you're worshiping with us. These days we do spend a lot of time in front of our screens, but to set this time apart as different as we worship God together, I invite you to light a candle to remind you of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, who holds us together while we are apart. Let us be called to worship with these words. God's Spirit dwells in us, for we are God's temple. We belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Praise the Lord.
because we belong to God, we can turn our gaze away from all that tempts us and see the one who loves us always. Let us turn our hearts towards God as we speak of our foolishness and failures. Please join me as we pray together. Holy One, we confess that at times our worries and concerns are trivial. We are distracted by the cares of the world we have created rather than the concerns of the needs around us. You taught us through Jesus Christ that to become first, we must become last of all and servant of all. When the world we have created for ourselves distract us with its imperfections and disappointments, call us to the needs of the greater world around us. Open our hearts to the needs of our neighbors and how we might best serve one another and you. In meeting the needs of those around us, we find that you are with us working alongside us. Encourage us to see past our own daily inconveniences to meet the struggles of our neighbors in need. In the name of Jesus Christ, who lived by example and called us to live in his way, we pray. Friends, this is the good news. We belong to Christ. He is the one who comes bringing life and hope to all. Because we belong to Christ, we belong to God. The Holy One is also the merciful one who fills our hearts with love. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. pray with me. Every day, O oh Lord, we need your guidance and your spirit to inspire us. Let your words breathe on us today and help us in the coming week. Open our minds and our hearts to hear your words proclaimed. May we be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today, our epistle reading is from Colossians, the first chapter, verses 15 through 20. Listen for the word of God. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the one who is first over all creation. Because all things were created by him, both in the heavens and on the earth, the things that are visible and the things that are invisible whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He existed before all things and all things are held together in him. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the one who is first born from among the dead so that he might occupy the first place in everything because all the fullness of God was pleased to live in him, and he reconciled all things to himself through him, whether things on earth or in the heavens. He brought peace through the blood of his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
second scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9-17. through 17. We are God's co-workers, and you are God's field, God's building. I laid a foundation like a wise master builder according to God's grace that was given to me, but someone else is building on top of it. Each person needs to pay attention to the way they build on it, No one can lay any other foundation besides the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So whether someone builds on top of the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, grass, or hay, each one's work will be clearly shown. The day will make it clear because it will be revealed with fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work survives, they will get a reward. But if anyone's work goes up in flames, they'll lose it. However, they themselves will be saved, as if they had gone through a fire. Don't y'all know that y'all are together God's temple, and God's Spirit lives in all y'all. If someone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, because God's temple is holy which is what y'all are. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now for our time with children, we're looking at another banner. Today's banner is for the Second Helvetic Confession. And I admit that's a really strange name, and I'll explain a little bit about what that means in a few minutes. But for now, I want to look at the pictures on the banner. And I want to talk about one picture, the one down on the bottom right side, the cup and the water. Can you remember seeing those in worship? We always have one of these special cups that we call a chalice on our great big communion table out in front of us. And then right in the middle of our sanctuary, we have a baptismal font our big bowl of water that we use when we baptize someone. I have a little one over here to help us remember. Communion, which we'll celebrate today, and baptism, which I hope we'll be celebrating again before too long, are two very special gifts that Jesus gives the church. And every time we do them, when we eat the bread and drink the juice at communion, and when we baptize someone, we remember how much Jesus loves us and all that he did for us. And the second Helvetic Confession talks a lot about how to be a church. It talks about baptism and communion. And that is the picture that we see over here with the bread and the water, reminding us of those two very important gifts that we do together as a church. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for bringing us together and making us your church. Thank you for the gifts of communion and baptism. When we see the water, the cup, or the bread, help us remember how much you love us so that we can love others too. Amen. In case you've lost track, this is our 21st week of our new or no longer new but for now normal. The way we mark days in the church is to say, for instance, that the last time we were in worship together in the sanctuary was the second Sunday in Lent. And today is cleverly named the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Perhaps it's appropriate to call this Sunday the 21st Sunday in Coronatide. In this Coronatide season, there is a lot to consider and discuss about how we do church, not just about the Sundays, but about everyday life in the church. Well, providentially for us, the Second Helvetic Confession offers some help with that. This confession is concerned about the everyday life of the church, and that means it's full of guidance about public worship, Christian education for children and youth, visitation of the sick, funerals, and financial stewardship. Sadly, it seems to leave out mission. Interestingly, It warns against long and irksome public prayer. It says, Care is to be taken, lest the congregation is wearied by too lengthy prayers. And when they are to hear the preaching of the gospel, they either leave the meeting or, having been exhausted, want to do away with it altogether. 
To such people, the sermon seems to be over long, which is otherwise brief enough. I'm just going to plead the fifth on that one. I mean, it's all relative, right? I mean, what counts as long anyway? And besides, I can't see you all looking at your watches right now. The confession also gives instructions about pastoral care, both for the pastor and the congregation. It's careful to point out that this is not popish visitation for extreme unction. That would be too Catholic. But it is clear that pastors should visit the sick and, when possible, the sick ought to let the pastor know that they are sick. The confession goes on to give instructions for family life, marriage, raising children, and even politics. All of these instructions are grounded in the idea that this is the kind of life we are called to live in response to grace. This is how we order our lives and our churches. Now, if you thought we were going to skip over our little mini history lesson about the context of this confession, you're out of luck. All of these instructions for how to be the church come out of a particular context. So at this point, you might be asking, what does Helvetic mean? And what happened to the first Helvetic confession? Well, Helvetic is the Latin word for Swiss, because this confession comes out of Zurich, Switzerland. The first Helvetic Confession was written in 1536 in an attempt to settle the conflict between the emerging Protestant movements in Western Europe. The first one didn't really do the job. The second one was written in 1566 by the same pastor, pastor Heinrich Bullinger. And by the time he wrote it, he had over 40 years of practical experience as a pastor. He wasn't just one of those out-of-touch ivory tower scholar types. He was also colleagues with the notable church leaders of the time, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Ulrich Zwingli. When Bullinger wrote this second one, he originally had it as part of his last will and testament. But when the conflict continued, he was asked to share it. Perhaps his well-read intellect and pastor's heart were exactly what were needed at a time when disagreement among Protestants threatened the integrity of the whole movement. Bullinger echoes scripture as he lays out how the church works together, how different gifts are woven together for the good of the whole body, and how the church, no matter how much disagreement it experienced, was still unified in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a highly ecumenical confession in an extremely fractious time. In the confession, we hear the many different images the Apostle Paul used to talk about the church. In the passage from 1 Corinthians that we read today, Paul shifts from having previously used the image of planting for the church to using the image of a building, a temple, to talk about the church. The foundation is Jesus. He is the one who holds us up, keeps the church from collapsing. And then there are a variety of stones and other materials that are used to build the structure on top of that foundation. Paul uses a variety of images to talk about the church. So does Bullinger in the Second Helvetic Confession. He writes about the church as an assembly of people who gather together to worship, as citizens of a city, and people who have relationships with each other. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is a flock of sheep with Jesus as the shepherd. In the Bible and in the confessions, no single image is adequate to describe the church. The church is all of those things. It is also the primary place where we encounter Jesus and grow in grace. We know that the church is a place where we can grow in our understanding of God, learn to pray, study the Bible, and build relationships. To say that the church is the primary place is not to say that it is the only place we encounter Christ or grow in grace. God can and does break into our lives in unexpected places, in ways that we would never imagine. You can meet God hiking in the mountains when you are filled with awe at the majestic beauty of God's creation. You can meet God walking along the beach 
filled with wonder at the relentless power of the waves and rejoicing in a beautiful sunrise. God can come to us on a golf car course, at the grocery store, while we're driving our car, and even online. However, the place where we are most likely to meet God is in the church. I've heard it said like this, you can eat a Whopper at KFC, but it's more likely to happen at Burger King. Jesus promises that whenever two or three gather together in his name, he is there. The primary place we meet Jesus, the most likely place, is in the church. And that is why being part of a church, participating in its life and ministry, is essential for the Christian life. Bullinger focuses much of the Second Helvetic Confession on how to be the church because he knew how important being church is. He was pastoring in a time when people finally had their own Bibles in their homes. And so he wanted to make sure that people didn't just decide to stay home and read the Bible and think that was enough. There's an entire chapter in this confession about the importance of public meetings of the church. The chapter about church meetings though, sounds a little different to me now than it ever has before. It reads, It is permitted all men to read the Holy Scriptures privately at home. Yet, in order that the word of God may be properly preached to the people, and prayers and supplication publicly made, also that the sacraments may be rightly administered, and that collections may be made for the poor, and to pay the cost of all the church's expenses, it is mostly necessary that religious or church gatherings be held. As many as spurn such meetings and stay away from them, despise true religion, and are to be urged by the pastors and godly magistrates to abstain from stubbornly absenting themselves from sacred assemblies. That last part, stubbornly absenting themselves, is about skipping church. Throughout this confession, the importance of gathering together as the church is stressed over and over again. And here we are, in a global pandemic, where it is not safe to gather together the way that we long to. And so questions have been raised about what is essential and how we can be the church if we can't gather physically in the same place. Some ecclesial bodies say that while worship online is good, it doesn't really count as real worship, and therefore the Lord's Supper should not be celebrated. Some historians have dug up records from churches from during the flu pandemic a hundred years ago. Churches and schools and businesses were shut down then too. Some local newspapers offered to run sermons and worship information in the Sunday paper, in the absence of Zoom and YouTube and Facebook Live. Heinrich Bullinger pastored through his own plague that swept through Zurich in 1564, and I wish I knew what they did about worship then. Still, considering all of these things, the confession is clear that we are called to live our lives of faith as part of the church, the community of disciples, Scripture is clear that God wants us to be together. I don't know if you noticed or not, but when I read the passage from 1 Corinthians, it wasn't a mistake from language hardwired into me from 27 years of calling Texas home. I said y'all a few times. I made that change because the Greek word is second person plural, and proper English doesn't have a word for that. So we just say you unless you're from the South. Don't y'all know that y'all are together God's temple and God's spirit lives in all y'all. The building up of the body is not about an individual you. It's about all of us. Y'all together. Paul and his co-workers built a temple out of a group of people. Paul says, don't y'all know that? It is an expression that he uses 10 times in 1 Corinthians. He uses, don't you know, when he wants to be clear that this is something that should be obvious. Together, all y'all are God's temple. We 
are God's church. Life together is important. That is the way God intended for us to be. And right now, we have to be the temple together without being together in the church building. But church was never supposed to be about the building. Jesus always meant for the people to be the church. And when we worship together, online or in person, when we care for one another, when we work for justice, when we study scripture together, we are God's temple. And God's spirit lives in all of us. Thanks be to God. Now I want to close this with the prayer that comes at the end of the second Helvetic Confession. Let us pray. We beseech God, our most merciful Father in heaven, that he will bless the rulers of the people and us, and his whole people, through Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior, to whom be praise and glory and thanksgiving for all ages. Amen. And now let us affirm our faith together with the words of the Second Helvetic Confession. Faith is not an opinion or human conviction, but a most firm trust and a clear and steadfast assent of the mind. But this faith is a pure gift of God, which God alone of his grace gives. The church is an assembly of the faithful, called or gathered out of the world, a communion of all saints, namely, of those who truly know and rightly worship and serve the true God in Christ the Savior, by the Word and Holy Spirit, and who by faith are partakers of all benefits which are freely offered through Christ. They are all citizens of the one city, living under the same Lord, under the same laws, and in the same fellowship of all good things. Amen. As we continue to be the church together, I hope you will check out the opportunities for connecting these days. New this week is a chance to watch the movie Come Hell or High Water about environmental justice and then join in a webinar about the movie and taking action. And even though things are very different this year with the start of the school year ahead, we still want to support our neighbors through Network's Cooperative Ministries Back to School Shop. You can find out more about these and other opportunities on our webpage, Facebook page, and in our weekly email. In your prayers, please do remember those on the prayer list that we send out to our worshiping community. As we marked the 150,000 deaths due to COVID-19 this week. We remember those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, those who are sick, the healthcare professionals, and the scientists working to learn more and fight the virus. And as we continue to face the virus of systemic racism, those working for justice, we pray that we may know ways that we can be agents of God's love and justice. And now, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high, asks the prophet. The answer is, God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? As a sign of our desire to do as God requires, let us give to God our tithes and offerings. If you would like to contribute a financial gift to St. Andrews, you can do so by mailing a check to the church or through online giving at sapctucker.org. You'll find a link to our giving at the bottom of the page. And this being the first Sunday of the month, we also offer our coins to support Change for Children and the Alliance for Children Everywhere. If you would like to, you can drop off your coins at Jeff Jackson's home or reach out to him and he would be happy to come pick them up. From you. Now in thanksgiving and joy, let us offer our lives to the Lord of all life as we sing together.
Let us pray. Almighty God, by your grace, accept our offering. Make us joyful in giving that we may grow in likeness to your supreme gift, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now is the time when we gather at the Lord's table. This is not the way we usually do it, but it is becoming our for now normal. And the truth is that Jesus gives us the gift of this meal as a way to remember his life, death, and resurrection. It is also far more than just remembering. He promises to meet us in this meal. Nothing magical happens to the bread and juice at this meal, but something mysterious does happen. Christ is really present with us, and we are lifted up into God's presence as we share the meal. I trust that God meets us in bread broken together, even when we are apart. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. By the mysterious wonder of our triune God, we gather to celebrate a feast for all time, joining with Jesus and his disciples in an upper room, with the church of the ages who have come together so often, with siblings in faith all along the way, and with people we know well and people we don't know at all. We trust that in this meal, the mystery of God will become real. In this meal, we gain a taste of the divine. And in this meal, we are fed as we go forth to serve in the world. Come, all of you, and share this feast of the holiness and wonder of God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you, holy God, for hearing your people's cries of pain, rescuing them from slavery. You fed their hunger and quenched their thirst and graciously led them to freedom. When they turned away from you, you did not hold this against them, but instead gathered them close, leading them with cords of kindness and bands of love. Tenderly you held them close and fed them once more, treating them with warm and tender compassion. You are truly the Holy One in our midst, revealing in Jesus that your love has no limits. At this table we bear witness to the love which has been poured into our hearts and lives. We remember when Jesus washed his disciples' feet and sat down at a table to share the meal with them. We remember and we give thanks for such an outpouring of love. Now pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, O God, and upon these gifts of bread and cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, his life in us. Renewed by his life and recreated in your image, we set our minds on fulfilling your purpose for us and this world of which we are a part. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's saving death until he, he comes again. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come.
And now let us pray. God of abundant compassion and extravagant love, we join our hearts and voices in prayer to you, trusting your promise to hear and respond, not as we deserve, but as your mercy dictates. Having been satisfied with the bread of heaven, we ask to be part of distributing the mercy, grace, and justice of our Lord. We know we have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. In that recognition, we remember those in our midst who are hungry. As this pandemic continues and many wrestle with unemployment or underemployment or dangerous employment, grant security in all its forms to those most anxious about their well-being and that of those they love. We know that all around us your beloved children long for healing in body, mind, or spirit. We know you see them with compassion and want for them an abundant life. May we be conduits of Christ's power, embodying your love to all. God of blessing and sending, we cannot count all the ways you come to us and give us that which we need. We revel in the beauty of creation. We relish the care of friends and family. We enjoy the taste of food, the voice of a loved one, the familiar melodies of hymns and the everyday mercies that are new every morning. As we sing our praise and express our thanks, we ask you to empower us to participate in your compassionate care for all the earth and every creature upon it. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. into the world to live your hopes and not your fears, knowing that you are held in holy hands that will never let you go. Alleluia. Amen.
After our sung benediction today, you all are invited to join us over on Zoom for our virtual narthex for a time of fellowship and also a time to share Christ's peace. As we prepare to depart from our worship gathering and carry our worship into the world and share the peace of Christ with our neighbors, let us greet one another with Christ's peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>